What are you up to, Brian? Uh, Morse message, Mike. Why's that? Well, I think we should get the message out. And it's obvious we're being attacked. We're not allowed to be TV-like. And uh, therefore, we're going to be wireless. I think that's what we need to do. Yes. Now, we've been, uh, we've discovered uh, quite a bit more about uh, Apfod. Well, in fact, it's not that we've discovered in the last 24 hours. But uh, actually, um, we believe that this is part of a much bigger uh, censorship agenda. Um, and so I think we're going to talk about, a bit about that today. But the last 24 hours has been particularly interesting, hasn't it? It's been very busy. A lot of people have produced some really good uh, responses. We've seen videos produced. We know a lot of people called Atvod. Well, what did Atvod do? They they switched off their uh, call centre or the, put the recorded message on. So a lot of good stuff. Uh, we've had some fantastic videos produced, um, which shows what people can do when they're motivated. Um, we've had, also had one or two people with a few gripes. Apparently, we're not doing enough, which is a bit I tricky. Think it's not that we're not doing enough; it's that we're doing the wrong thing. So, so the way we've gone about this has been wrong, and really, we should have fought this privately and using using various forms of, of law, uh, of the law. Uh, and uh, and well, of course, if we if we did that, uh, nobody would know about it. Yeah. So we're going to stick by what we do best, which is we're going to make sure we publicise what's happening. The exposure the, uh, yeah. is the key weapon. Yeah. And uh, we'll say to people who are pointing the law at us, we absolutely know what you're saying and we agree with all the good work that's being done around common law in particular at the moment. Um, but we don't think it's our job at the moment to divert from what we do best in order to get tied up in corrupt, fraudulent courts. Indeed. And we'd just like to point out again, this is not an interview. Yeah, I forgot about that. And actually, we didn't uh, announce the start of the program. What, what is this program? Uh, well, it's it's UK column, UK column wireless, I think it is. Wireless today. today. Wireless, yeah. yeah. Okay. And of course, we're not in the car. We are in the kitchen. Well, I I thought if I was transmitting, I should change location. It's very important. Well, well aside from that, if we were if we were in the same place twice, we might be considered to be studio based, and, yeah. and therefore, uh, yes. So that. This is a kitchen. They do programs, of course, from kitchens. Does does that make it a studio? Uh, I think the kitchen yeah, sense of the word. Only if you're cooking. Okay. Well, we're not. No, we don't have a cooker anyway. No. Mm. Right. Um, so uh, the uh, of course we have taken a stand on the issue of of Atford, um, but Atford is only part of the larger pie of of media regulation and and particularly increasingly media censorship. Um, and uh, this is uh, an issue we have been discussing, well, I believe since uh, 2012. Um, this was this was February 2012 issue of the UK column, and, and as we were not allowed to put graphics up, we will show you a photocopy of the pa of the paper. Yeah. Uh, and we were actually the first uh, news organisation uh, to uh, expose the links between the Leveson inquiry uh, and common purpose and the Media Standards Trust and people are immediately going to be asking I'm sure what the connection is between Levison and Atvod and, yeah. and so on uh, but I think what we're about to show is that uh, that uh, there are direct links between this entire agenda which is not just limited to the internet but in fact all all media discussion of events yeah there's a very big picture operating Mike isn't there yeah. and uh, we're going to say that uh, we pushed out that there was this original connection. We're very pleased to say the Daily Mail, first of all, picked up on it and then started eventually to run with an 11, 12 page story. The Telegraph got involved, the Sun got involved. And as we're going to show in a minute, the mainstream press are still asking questions about yes. what's going on. Yes. So have we started something? I think we did. We hope so. But this isn't just about an app fault. This is this this is a tiny part of something much bigger and much more dangerous. Yes. Now before we get on to that um, as a whole, and I'm not asking this in a in I hope an interview style, no. uh, but can we can we just discuss uh, this issue of independence? Um, what what is the definition? Do you think, or in your mind, what is the definition of independence with regard to? Uh, what is going, you know, with regard to public service, and when you're taking part in these, uh, these Community. supposedly, uh, these boards that, that make policy, what what is the definition of independence? Do you think? Well, you don't have any connections um, with the organisations that are part of the debate, or you don't, you you're not so heavily connected into people within the 
the sphere of debate that your opinion could be compromised. Okay, but it's a, it's a bit of a difficult area, isn't it? Because of course they want to have people that they perceive as being qualified to actually make judgments. That's on, true. Right. So how do you find? How do you? I mean, do you have an opinion on this? How do you find people that, that actually are genuinely independent in that case? Well, one of the things that comes into my mind is that if you've got people who are going to make judgment on what free press is, you should have a team of people who are genuinely. Um, independent members of the public, people from some of the houses behind us. So, so perhaps you agree with me that it's really pretty arrogant um, to suggest that um, that members the, that there are no intelligent members of the public that can't make rational decisions on on things, and um, that in fact you need to have somebody with thirty years experience in the industry that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, in it's order to make like, an, independent, an independent judgment. Yeah, it's a bit like having a banker in order to make judgment on banking regulation because there's been fraud and corruption, isn't it? Right. We need another banker. So yesterday I mentioned one independent member of the Athlot Board. Uh, I just wanted to, to raise raise one more, uh, and that's a guy called Robin Foster, and he was just appointed in uh, in uh, May. Yeah. And he has replaced a lady called. Uh, uh, Julia Horny, uh, sorry, Hornell, it looks like Horny, and bearing in mind that that thought's main activity, I thought that was quite ironic, but it was actually it's, it was a just misreading. Um, Good job it's wireless uh, here, Mike. Indeed. Otherwise, this could be a bit television-like. Robin Foster, then, uh, independent board member of Atvod, appointed in May 2014, founding member of Communications Chambers, which is a group of independent experts in media and telecommunications, including senior level advice on policy, but before that he was a partner for strategy at Ofcom, and before that he was a director of strategy at the BBC, and before that he was controller of corporate strategy at the BBC, uh, and uh, well strangely his CV seems to have about 10 years missing between that and coming out of Cambridge University, but you've got to ask, how, does this, how is this person independent? Yeah. And this is the same question that we're going to ask in a second when we start discussing Levison of course. Yeah, well, we know that so far everything that's come out of um, Atvod, and you're seeing it, you're seeing it across um, uh, other boards. These people are all selected; they're all appointed. Right, but there's more, right? Because uh, Robin Foster also serves on the uh, Ofcom Spectrum Spectrum Advisory Board, Off uh, Ofsab, or sorry, Osab, as it's called. Now, this is not an Ofcom board; it's an independent board, in inverted commas. Uh, which reports to Ofcom on how to divvy up the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. This is an independent board yeah. uh, advising Ofcom. So let's have a look on that. Aside from uh, Robin Foster, who we've already established is not independent because he worked for the BBC for quite a long time and in fact worked for Ofcom itself, uh, we've got David Hendon, who is a member of the Smart Meter Strategic Programme Board. So of course there's no, no agenda there because Smart Meters, they don't use the electromagnetic spectrum at all, do they? So there's absolutely no uh, uh, conflict of interest. Now, he was also on the Department of Energy and C Climate Change. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that was at the sorry, that I yeah. apologize. I was at the Department of Energy and Climate Change. He was also a director of the Department of Business, Innovation, and Skills. So this is a government man, man right? Uh, Dr. Robert Pepper leads Cisco Global Technology Policy. This is the company which is driving the Internet of Things. So there's no conflict of interest there either, and how the the electromagnetic spectrum is divvied up. Um, Jean-Jacques Sahel, director uh, of uh, policy at Skype stroke Microsoft, so no conflict of interest there. He's an ex-chairman of OECD Working Party on the Information Economy, and he was the UK signatory to the United Nations ITU Convention and Constitution, and that was the uh, in international telecommunication. We're looking at global governance here yeah. of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and then we've got Gavin Young, Head of Strategy and Planning within Cable and Wireless, so no conflict of interest there. Uh, and Mike Walker, who is Group, group Research and Development Director at Vodafone Group of Companies, so no conflict of interest there either. So we've got uh, a range of completely independent people advising Ofcom on how to uh, so divide up the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and uh, Robin Foster is uh, part and parcel of that group, uh, also completely independent. Yeah, brilliant. So, so you know, I, I just uh, I'm struggling to find uh, a definition for independent which fits this picture. Yeah, and in the in the middle of this lot, we've we've got Atvod. Um, should we bring in the Media Standards Trust? Sure, that'd be a good good yes. place to go. So there's there's a 
That's an interesting little report, isn't it? Yeah. This is the Media Standards Trust. Now, do you want to give us a bit of background on what that is? Or uh, well, ba basically, this is having a look at... No, no, the Media oh. Standards Trust itself, I mean. Oh, right, okay. Uh, it's a good job we're not live, isn't it? Because yes. I'd have really messed that up. <laughs> um, what we've got is the uh, Media Standards Trust. we just have a little read through the board. It says it's governed by a board comprising respected figures from civil society and the media, and it meets four times a year to decide on the overall strategy. And we've got Mary Ellen Barker, a journalist. We've got Sir David Bell. There's Sir David Bell, if anybody wants to be reminded what Sir David Bell looks like. Uh, and he, he... Well, he was Chair of Trustees Common Purpose, but also formerly Chairman of the Financial Times. And of course, Pearson Group, mm -hmm. which was the company well in behind the setting up of the Media Standards Trust in the first place. And just in case anybody doesn't remember what Julia Middleton looks like, uh, there she is. Yes, thank you, Mike. Yes. Um, so we've got Sir David Bell, we've got Sir Cyril Chantler, Chairman of the King's Fund, and if people don't know what the King's Fund is about, look it up. We've got Geraint Talfan Davies, Chair of the Institute of Welsh Affairs, Will Davies, Research Fellow in Governance, and he's with the Side Business School, University of Oxford. Remember that the good old Side Business School had money from a gentleman, I believe, had been involved in international arms deals. Uh, Roger Grief, Films of Record, Baroness Helena Kennedy, lawyer, writer, broadcaster, principal of Mansfield College, Oxford, David Lyon, developing world, developing world correspondence, BBC, Charles Manby, Goldman Sachs, Julia Middleton, Common Purpose, the Right Reverend Stephen Platten, Bishop of Wakefield, Sir Anthony Saltz, Executive Vice Chairman, Enim Rothschild, and also a member of the Scott Trust, which put money into the Media Standards Trust. And the Guardian, of course. And the Guardian. Albert Scardino, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Anthony Smith, broadcaster, Sue Stapley, Sue Stapley Consulting, she's obviously a very special lady, and Sir Robert Worcester, who just happens to be the founder of Maury Pole. And I think if you look in the front of that, we find, surprise, surprise. So, so this, is, this is a Media Standards Trust report. Uh, and it's uh, entitled, Can Independent Self-Regulation Keep Standards High and Preserve Press Freedom? Now, of course, uh, as you would imagine, uh, there, there was no conflict of interest on any of the people on the, uh, on the uh, board of uh, the Leveson Inquiry because David Bell wasn't on it. Uh, and David Bell wasn't anything to do with the Media Standards Trust, nor was he anything to do with Common Purpose. Uh, you are being that, sarcastic here, Mike. Would I? Anyway, right. so, so this, this is an interesting little report because what they're, they're talking about is the independent custodian of the code. Right. Was that something to do with what you were doing earlier? Well, I hope not. Acting on behalf of the public in the public interest, the independent arbiter, the first port of call, become a membership organization, uh, a range of available remedies and for breaches of the code, independence of the industry, and so on. Uh, and. But uh, what is fascinating in this little report is that, of course, they are holding APTVOD up as being um, a standard to which they should um, apply. So, so we got, we've got common purpose with Sir David Bell and Julia Middleton, who helped found the Media Standards Trust. Let me just get this in my head. Uh, the Media Standards Trust then drives all of the background agenda to get Leveson. They started the hacked off campaign, they pushed that whole hacked yeah. off campaign, they drove the Leveson inquiry. Right, and then in the background we got the same Media Standards Trust with Anthony Saltz, the NM Rothschild man who's actually part of the report you've got in your hand. They just happen to be the people that are now pushing Atvod forward as a... Yes, and let's not right. forget that David Bell, this man, David Bell, uh, who set up the Media Standards Trust, resigned from the Media Standards Trust just prior to the uh, Leveson inquiry, and that made him independent. Yeah. Yes. Okay, let's just remember that. So, so Media Standards Trust is saying that APVOD is a very good organisation and we need it. Yes. What can, what can you tell us on that? Then? Well, they say that APVOD enforces a code of conduct under an independent chairman, uh, it has been deemed successful by Ofcom. They say that Advod's object objectives are primarily to, quote, regulate the conduct of its members in relation to their provision of television on demand. So you notice it doesn't say video on demand services. It doesn't say YouTube services. It says television on demand services. 
so as to ensure television on demand providers are committed to delivering a broad range of high quality consumer services. It says, quote, develop and keep under constant review a code of practice containing standards and core pr principles. So they have to develop that and they have to keep it under review. So it's, uh, it's developed, developing, uncertain. Under change, uncertain. So that's reinforced here. And this clearly is a, a, a way of doing things that the Media Standards Trust thinks is a good way of doing things because obviously it will change over time. Yeah. Uh, and they say uh, that Advot's constitution empowers the directors to pass rules or bylaws governing the terms of membership. So once you are a member of Advot, uh, at any point subsequent to that, uh, the board of directors can decide just to change the terms and conditions of your membership. Uh, and of course, uh, you could choose to leave, but at that in that case, what, what happens then? Well, presumably they come out and point a finger at you and say, we're going to regulate you anyway. Uh, they, I would guess. Yes. So, so uh, there, there is no basis in law for this is the main, is the main point here. Yeah. There is no basis in law for any of this. Uh, or for, for any changes in the in the uh, criteria that are applied, in any changes in who the criteria are applied to, and so on. Yeah. But Media Standards Trust believe that Advod is the beacon of how this should be done, uh, and of course they're they're uh, disappointed at the minute that that Levison hasn't turned out quite how they hoped it would, uh, yeah. but nonetheless they're still campaigning for this. Okay. If I can just steal one of these uh, these early ones here. Um, I just found it interesting, the acknowledgement, this is them praising themselves, the Media Standards Trust would like to thank those who have assisted the drafting of the document. The Press Complaints Commission took great care to explain its work to the Media Standards Trust. Now we know the Media Standards Trust was absolutely attacking the Press Complaints Commission in a vicious way in order to get Leveson in. Sir Robert Worcester and the team at Ipsos Mori helped design the opinion poll research. Well they would, wouldn't they, because they're part of... Media Standards Trust. But they're independent. Yeah. And then the chairman, Anthony Saltz, provided tireless scrutiny and encouragement. Well, that's when he wasn't driving the international banking scene through the Rothschilds. But the work would not have been possible without the support of the Trust core funders, notably the Pearson Foundation, which just sorry, happens... Sorry, is that... Is that David Bell's Pearson Foundation? The, well, it's the very same group of companies and their foundation, yeah. So the same foundation. So that's independent. Yeah. And then Esme Fairburn Foundation, which we'll come back to, the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust, and the Gatsby Foundation. That's the Great Gatsby? Yeah, the Great Gatsby. So what's the significance of this? Well, we need to come over here to a Daily Mail article. Um, we're sorry we're not allowed to produce graphics, uh, you know, we've already explained why that is. Wireless. Mm. Um, so we printed out part of the headline, this chilling new assault on free speech for years, a noble British charity for the freedom of expression around the world. Now it's being undermined by press hating zealots of Hacked Off. Hacked Off being created by the Media Standards Trust. Yes. So what were they talking about? They were talking about um, a British charity called Index on Censorship. Suddenly it's had all of its funding pulled, 400,000 pounds, and they've got trouble surviving now, reporting on uh, where freedom of speech has been shut off around the world. Ah, but that situation, when, when was that report? Uh, well, this article, yes. it was um, the 19th of June. Right, because, because of course Index on Censorship now has um, none other than Hugh Grant is one of its trustees. Yeah, Hugh Grant, I think, was one of the big supporters of the Hacked Off campaign. Yes. And he was one of the key witnesses at Leveson. Indeed. So he's now come into a charity that was doing a really good job pointing out where freedom of speech was being suppressed and um, all of a sudden funding's been withdrawn. Yes. So where was the funding coming from? Well, the funding just happened to be coming from the Esme Fairburn Foundation. Yes. And what the, uh, what the Daily Mail article points out here is that Esme Fairburn has a portfolio of investments worth 827 million. Yes. So nearly a billion pounds in the hands of a group of people, I don't know who these people are, but they can come in and get involved in the process to influence what's going to happen with the press. But 
it's independent money, Brian. You, you don't need to worry about it because it's independent money. Do you reckon any of their portfolio will be connected with the Rothschild banking interest? Couldn't possibly be because it's all independent money. Right. I mean, uh, the, the, look, we've got Esme Fairburn Foundation, we've got Joseph Rowntree Trust. It's amazing that these are all trusts and foundations. We've got uh, Open Society Foundation, we've got the Pearson Foundation, how many others can you think of? Thousands. Thousands. Yeah. All these, all this money, all this money sloshing around, which is going to good causes, is going to charities. Yeah. And, and we've made this point before, 40,000 charities or whatever it is in this country, you would think nobody would be in need. Yeah. Because you know, obviously charities are there to help people that are in need. So. Well, they were till Tony Blair got them, and then he created the third sector, and the idea was to use charities in order to put uh, policy through. Right. And part of that policy, of course, is to count down freedom of the press. Right. So I just read a little bit here. In 2005, Sir David and Common Purpose founder Julia Middleton, an author and leadership expert, established the Media Standards Trust an independent registered charity that fosters independent registered charity that fosters high standards in news on behalf of the Who public. Who said this? Uh, they did. Right. Uh, which was based at the Common Purpose offices. Mm. Sir David Bell was MST's first chairman. That year, the Esme Fairburn Foundation gave the fledgling organisation 70 grand. Right. Among the, M the Media Standards Trust trustees was Albert Scardino, husband of Sir David's boss at Pearson. So that's not incestuous at all? Uh, pretty much so, yeah. Mm. But um, she's also one of the people apparently favourite to become chair of the BBC Trust. And then um, basically um, they're tied in with the MacArthur Foundation. And, ah, another one, yeah. yeah. And, um, Esme Fairburn gave the Media Standards Trust 150 grand in 2009. So, as you say, pretty incestuous, but don't worry because it's independent. It's independent. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's really the theme here. Well, I, th I think we've got, to, we've got to say that if people just think what we are witnessing at the moment is Atvod coming to take out the UK column because they don't like us, could it be because we're the very people that expose Common Purpose and Leveson? Well, well that's this quite... Is much bigger. Yes, that's quite possible. This is much bigger. It is. It, the, you look at this rat's nest of, of uh, independent advisors and the organisations and foundations that, were, that, that they're working with and you find them in every single censorship agenda that is uh, being pushed forward in this yeah. country at the moment. Uh, and this is not uh, a conspiracy. It's, uh, it's fact. Or a criminal conspiracy. It, it, it is criminal in, yeah. its, in its intent um, and uh, completely unconstitutional. Right. So we'd like to say something to the people out there on the other end of the wireless, and that is that the key to dealing with what's going on is exposure of what the system really is. And if we're going to be a little bit crunchy and we say we're getting a lot of advice at the moment as to what we should do, we should do this, we should do that. And key, a key part of that is what these people are doing is against the law. Well, we know that. We also know the courts are corrupt, and that's why we've got the UK column, because we're trying to tell people. So if people want to challenge this by going through common law, which we support, we need you to do it, because we've got enough on our plate at the moment reporting that many people need to wake up, because the moment free media is closed down, what we're going to see is the secret arrests spiralling, Remember, reported in the mainstream media to date, 600 people arrested in secret by the new crime body, mothers being arrested and sectioned and forcibly drugged to stop them ex exposing paedophile rings, people dying in police stations. This is the reality of life in Britain today, and that's why we need free press and media. So. I think we're going to say UK column flat out at the moment, getting the truth out about what's happening. We're giving you the ammunition. Am I allowed to say ammunition, Mike? It's not, it's in it's the kitchen. not, it's not a television like term, so no. I don't see any problem with it. Well, this is a wireless word. We're giving you the ammunition to really take the lid off and expose these people. What we don't need is people coming back to us and saying, well, UK column, what you need to do is this and that. We need your help. You need our help if we all work together 
we can deal with what's starting to happen but critical this is a massive octopus strangling free speech on uh, on the internet but it'll it'll come to tv it'll come to wireless yeah so tonight uh, at 6 p.m on the live stream ukcolumn.org slash live there is a an issue maybe yes uh, a version yes we're not allowed to say episode of doom watch uh, yeah. it's going to be very interesting indeed uh, please join us for that six o'clock until eight o'clock tonight um, and, good uh, yes and i'll add thank you very much to all the people that have been pushing the book oh, sorry the yeah. uh, <laughs> the wireless episodes around uh, the car the men in the car that is starting to move. We're fascinated to see the response from the American audience uh, because Americans just do not understand that Britain is much closer to a police state than America, even though we don't have the guns, perhaps because we don't have the guns. But I'm using that word in a kitchen sense, Mike, so. Yeah. Now, I'm sitting here wondering how we end this because, of course, we are well, not in the studio. No. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, I actually have to get up well, and, and what, switch the camera on. While you're doing that, I'll just say many people will not have believed this was a radio. They think it's something to do with dog biscuits. But I'm just going to show you that if I can hold this up to camera, I assure you that this is the real thing. Do you so, have an Ofcom license to operate that? Oh my goodness. Uh, it's below 10 watts. Okay. I'll leave you to switch the camera off. Okay.